All right, so let us get started. Hello and welcome everybody to our conference on machine learning and economic inequality. Um, first of all, let me say that I am really excited about our lineup of excellent speakers we got for today and tomorrow. And we managed to have speakers from a whole variety of fields. And so today the focus is gonna be more on economics and computer science and statistics. And tomorrow we will have a number of talks from scholars in law before circling back to a perspective from information science and computer science. And what I'm going to do the next few minutes is I'll give you kind of a quick motivation and introduction for how we came about um, organizing this conference and kind of what, what were the motivating ideas and maybe some topics that I hope we will discuss over the next couple of days. And so, as I guess all of you are very aware of, there has been a very, very quick spread of automated decision making in all kinds of settings in recent years, and increasingly also in what I would think of as socially consequential settings. So algorithms are being used for decision making in contexts like hiring, inviting people to crop into use, allocating consumer credit, Bail setting, especially in the US criminal system, news feed selection on social media and search engines, pricing by big online warehouses, and so on. And so, um, this, this spread of automated decision making in consequential settings has um, led to all, all kinds of social concerns. And one of the leading concerns that has been discussed, especially over the last three or four years, is the question of fairness of automated decision making. But usually, at least as, as I see it, fairness is conceived uh, in a fairly narrow sense. So ultimately, a lot of the notions of fairness that are floating around are of the form um, whether we can rationalize unequal treatment of different people by profit maximization or some related objective. And so one of the goals of this conference is to kind of shift the focus of this debate a bit, um, go away from this exclusive focus on the fairness of decision making and think more about the causal impact of AI on inequalities along various dimensions. And so one way to think about this distinction is in terms of different normative paradigms. So kind of a crude way to, to classify different ways of thinking normatively about decision-making and decision-making systems is as follows. We have one perspective, and that's the perspective that's underlying most of the fairness discourse is about just desserts, which um, for instance, aligns with the perspective of libertarianism. So this is about the servingness of merit. So I guess fairness or just desserts ask usually, does everyone get what they deserve based on the merit? So it's about explaining where treatment comes from. And a very different perspective, and the one I think that we're going to focus on more in this conference is um, thinking in terms of consequences, the quad consequentialist perspective which is in particular the perspective that most of welfare economics is taking, is asking how does this policy or this algorithm and so on affect the well-being of those who are impacted by the algorithm or the policy. And just to really drive home this point, um, the distinction between fairness and equality, I think, can be summarized as follows. Um, where fairness is about treating people of the same merit independently of the group membership. So unequal treatment is justified by inequality of merit, wherever that notion of merit is coming from. Um, whereas equality is about the consequences, not about where the treatment is coming from, but um, what the uh, downstream consequences of the treatment assignment are. So the way I think about equality is about the counterfactual or causal consequences of algorithms or changes to algorithms for the distribution of welfare, however defined of different people. And the distinction really matters between these two different perspectives. So one, one type of um, distinction where it matters is when we think about what's the impact of increased surveillance or improved prediction algorithms, which um, gener generally are going to lead to a treatment assignment that's gonna be more aligned with merit. And so very often it will be the case that this type of improved surveillance and prediction will be good for fairness in the sense of aligning treatment with merit, but will often be bad for equality by, by leading to more fine-grained distinctions in treatment assignment as opposed to a one-size-fits-all. And another set of com comparisons where the distinction matters is if we think about any affirmative action or compensatory intervention or redistribution policy that try to compensate pre-existing inequalities, which usually will be bad for fairness because they imply unequal treatment that's not justified by merit and profit maximization, but will be good for equality by definitions and compensating inequalities. 
And so a second slightly different angle that I also hope we will discuss and maybe especially tomorrow in the context of the more legally focused talks will be about property rights and how we organize the control of data and algorithms. And so I think one, one useful frame for thinking about that is that a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence is really about optimization. There is some notion of reward or some objective function that's being maximized under uncertainty um, about the world and the algorithm is learning about the world and trying to make decisions that maximize the objective. But of course, in the social context, we have to ask the question whose objective is being maximized. Like there's not like one, one objective that everybody shares. And so in, I guess, a uh, capitalist economy that then implies that whoever owns and controls the data and algorithms is going to be the agent who determines what the objective is that's being maximized by these technologies. And so one obvious way to, to drive the point home is like, why, why is 80% of AI research dedicated to maximizing ad clicks? Or might, might there be other objective functions that might be more socially useful for for all these amazing technologies. And the related question that I think is very much non-obvious is how could alternative ownership and control structures for data and algorithms look like? And so a flip side of this question of who controls the data and algorithms is who do we think as the audience for work about the social impact of AI? But again, it's a field that has been really exploding over the last few years. But I guess we have to ask ourselves who, who do we speak to if, if we're engaging in these debates and whose perspective do we take? And I think the most common perspective is that of like a profit maximizing corporation that's trying to avoid litigation or bad press for discrimination. And so then algorithmic auditing is really kind of to, to prevent these kind of side constraints for kicking in for a corporation. But in principle, you could also think of very different audiences for, for this work. We can think about workers and unions. We can think about government regulators and policymakers. We can think about consumers and NGOs and other civil society actors as kind of the target audience for, for this type of research and as the type of agents whose, whose perspective or objectives we implicitly take when we talk about these topics. And yeah, so I hope we will hear a lot of interesting and different perspective on these questions over the next few days. To, to, to wrap up my introduction, just some housekeeping. So we are going to have five days talks today and five talks tomorrow. The goal is to have talks be 40 minutes long and then each talk is followed by 10 minutes of discussion time. And then after that, we will have a number of breaks to, uh, uh, to, to give you a bit of break between the, the discussions and talks. And in terms of questions and comments, the, the plan is that panel members can just unmute themselves to, to ask questions or make comments. And for everybody else, I would ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box in, that you see in Zoom. And then at the appropriate moment, Spinta will read out your questions or call on you to ask the question yourself. And I would ask you that during talks to limit yourself to only clarifying questions. Um, there is after the talks, any, any comments or criticisms are fair game. All the talks are live streamed and recorded, so uh, uh, be aware of that. If you ask a question, you will be in the recording. And we will also um, post the recordings of the talks for later watching on YouTube for the speakers who gave their agreement to do that. And yeah, I guess um, all of you have seen this, but the conference program here is on my website here. And that also has the link to the YouTube channel where the conference is being live streamed and where we are going to post the videos later. And so with this, let me just briefly ask Binta to introduce herself and then we will turn it over to Abby for our first talk. And I'm very much looking forward to this. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, Max. So uh, I'm Binta and I'm here based at the Econ department. I'll be uh, monitoring your questions. Um, yeah, so to Abby, I think you can share now, great. 